In today's episode, we are talking to registered dietitian Elizabeth Lee. We'll explore with Elizabeth the intersection of nutrition research and coaching, the non judgmental environment vital for holistic nutrition coaching, and discuss what culturally inclusive nutrition coaching looks like. Stay tuned. As a registered dietitian, Elizabeth has spent the last decade in various nutrition-related roles, ranging from patient counseling to employee well-being programming to teaching. She is drawn to the many disciplines that share intersections with food, culture, sustainability, politics, and socioeconomics, just to name a few. She started Communal Table Wellness as a way to explore all those intersections in her work with individual coaching and organization consulting. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me, Shireen. Such a pleasure having you on. So first things first, Elizabeth, our first question usually is, what led you to this? Can you share a little bit more about what drew you into the field of nutrition and coaching to begin with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, As a whole, nutrition has been something that I didn't quite think about going into until I was well into college. Um, My path was going to go into med school um, and I was interested in pediatrics. But after organic chemistry, I realized that that was probably a time point that I should rethink my decision. It was not um, my greatest accomplishment (laughs) in terms of classes. And at the same time, um, around that time, I went to a career panel that was hosted by my university, uh, UC Santa Barbara, a shout out to my alma mater. And uh, there was a dietitian who was there speaking on careers are related to health, but not going into medicine, nursing. And that really piqued my interest. And as far as what about coaching and research that I'm interested in, um, coaching is something that's been part of my career for some time. I started out in community nutrition, working for a Head Start program. And after that, a number of roles I've had um, really involved one-on-one coaching or group counseling. It was not a career path that I had planned, but I ended up really enjoying it. Um, I really enjoyed the interactions with the individuals. So it's something that I kept on pursuing. And as for research, it's a little bit more of a happenstance. I was involved in a course that was headed up by Dr. Christopher Gardner at Stanford, and an opening um, came up in his lab group to help with the research they they were conducting. So I came on board as a health educator for his lab group, and it really piqued my interest because it is still counseling to an extent, but very much so done in a different setting with a different population I haven't worked with before. So that's kind of my path. That's how I uh, landed in my current portfolio of experiences, if you will. It's an interesting pathway. You know, you you talked a little bit about sort of navigating your way through. Uh, You've really gained diverse experiences across teaching, research, counseling, coaching, uh, and then, uh, you know, all of this being around nutrition. How do these three different avenues sort of shape or even inspire your understanding of nutrition? Yeah, um, I think they really feed into each other. So in teaching, I often have uh, discussions about myths and half truth with students because they're exposed to them and are curious about them. I think anybody that is um, somewhat interested in nutrition or just eat food in general, which is many of us, all of us, um, we are exposed to some of those myths and half-truths on a regular basis. And I think these often really mirror the questions that my own clients have um, naturally. And another big topic of discussion in nutrition classes is correlation versus causation, which is very much related to research. So being part of the research group has really broadened my understanding of study design, participant recruitment, and data capture. And I think it's human nature to want to draw a straight line between cost and effect. So my experience and research there has really been a helpful reminder to myself, but also something that I can bring into teaching and coaching to say, hey, slow down, let's look at the science and beyond the headlines to see like what is really going on. So for all of those things that kind of come together, I think they really feed into each other and continue to shape and inspire my understanding of nutrition. 
Interesting. Um, my next question to you is uh, around some of the coaching work that you do. Um, what really led you to establish that? In fact, you have an initiative called uh, Communal Table Wellness. Can you tell us a little bit about that and also strategies that you implement uh, to achieve some of these initiatives? Yeah, so Communal Table Wellness is uh, my business that I started a couple of years ago. And it really started as a combination to meet a couple of my own wants. Um, I wanted to put some fun back into food because I think food has really gotten serious and clinical. Um, and food is really a symbol of culture to me. It's a token of care. It's a really potent connector. And all of that seems to have kind of been stripped and distilled into nutrition science. Um, and for that, that's why I think it's gotten serious and clinical. Um, and then there's also this desire of mine to speak to the missing or muted East Asian culture representation that I've been seeing in nutrition. So when I first started thinking about starting a business, I had been away from nutrition coaching for a few years and I sort of missed it, but I knew I didn't want to go back to it in the same way that I was doing patient counseling years ago. So leading up to starting the business in 2020, 2021, there was a lot of conversation about cultural representation that made me examine my own identities and culture, and especially in the context of food and my profession. And at the same time, I saw a lot of very innovative and original ways that artists, advocates, writers, uh, they were building community and teaching very interesting things uh, virtually. So all of it really got me thinking about how I can be creative about nutrition education and coaching, where people will feel included, seen, and walk away with not just useful information, but practical skills. So Communal Table Wellness really was born with the intention of not just offering one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also some virtual and in-person workshops that are centered on conversations and connections. You know, when you talk about culturally uh, culturally inclusive is what you said? Right? Yeah. Um, coaching, when you're talking about a term like that, it, you know, it, it can seem very layered. There's a lot within that that needs to be taken into account. I would like to get your perspective as you're an RD to really understand what does sort of general coaching, and I say general with with quote air quotes here, but what does sort of this general coaching look like? And then what does culturally inclusive coaching look like? How is it different or even similar for that matter uh, in terms of tools or resources that may intersect across both, both ways of providing coaching? Sure. Um, and you're so spot on about it being a layered concept. And I just want to put out the disclaimer that I'm not an expert on this, whatsoever, um, there's still a lot to learn and there's still a lot that I don't know. But for me, what um, culturally inclusive coaching looks like is if a client comes to us as dietitians that we understand what some of those um, cultural meanings of food uh, might, or what some of those food might hold for them in terms of cultural meanings. Um, so for example, I've worked with a number of clients who are from the East Asian background, and oftentimes um, there is a conversation about, well, if I don't finish certain things that are put in front of me, that would be very disrespectful. Um, but they don't want to maybe eat certain things or cannot finish certain portions that are given to them because it doesn't align with their health goals. So how to understand that? And I think having um, that kind of understanding as a dietitian uh, is really important. And I think this is why it's so important to have diversity in our field in terms of just different cultures being represented in our profession, because then that way our clients and our patients can pick and choose who they want to work with um, and who seem to understand and who gets them. I think at the end of the day, that's what it is. So while there's a lot of overlap, like the nutrition science concepts doesn't really differ based on the individual per se, there's a lot of uh, broad things that just apply to all of our patients and our clients. But in terms of resources, for example, if I'm working with somebody who has diabetes, and I just give them kind of a run of the mill type of handout that doesn't have a lot of the foods that they typically eat. 
um, it might seem kind of discouraging to them. Like, okay, well, none of the foods that I eat are on here. And also, are you telling me that I need to completely switch what I'm eating, what my diet looks like? Um, so I have created some handouts. I've created some resources for my, my clients. But also, I think there's a lot of dietitians out there who've done a phenomenal job in putting out resources so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then some health organizations have done, th done so as well. So that's been really helpful. So hopefully that um, chips at the question, the very layered concept of what cultural inclusivity looks like in my practice for you. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the reason also I asked that question is because that's a lot of what we see. And the definitions sometimes, I'm so glad you brought up some of the other definitions of what culturally, culturally inclusive uh, work can look like because I feel that um, in English to another language translation is not culturally affirming. We need to think beyond those translations. And the reason why I say that is um, even in the work that we do at Yamlish today, we're very focused uh, starting out in the Hispanic community. Um, but I know at the, at the same time when people will even introduce my work, they'll say, oh, you know, they do Spanish work and I was like mm, okay it's a little bit more than Spanish because it's culturally affirming so I think there's something around the definition of that that broadly people are still understanding as to like what it means to be culturally affirming and you know just a plain sort of language translation it's not to discount that a translation is is probably appropriate in certain instances but uh, culturally uh, you know affirming or culturally inclusive goes far beyond that yeah. And I like that as a dietitian, you are so focused on including some of those things within within the work that you do. Yeah, thank you. And I think you bring up a great point that translations language is just one part of it. Um, but there's a lot more to the culture besides just the language. So how the culture perceives the food, like how historically maybe food has been used, um, how it may have some traditional um, it holds like certain place in traditions for different populations. I think that's also um, a big part of it. And in my practice, I have tried to um, refer coaching clients to another practitioner at times when I don't feel like I am the best fit for them, whether it is the area of expertise that they're seeking out or the culture is not necessarily a misalignment, but I just feel like there might be somebody else better um, in my network who can speak to them, uh, speak to their culture than I can. And I think having those kinds of connections that they can have right off the bat with a dietitian, um, it just makes for a much more enjoyable coaching experience. And it's almost like a shortcut, like they don't have to explain so much um, and they don't have to give like an entire Wikipedia page to the context that they're trying to explain, which I think is really beneficial for, for the, the clients. And I think there, there's also the element of uh, sort of, um, um, uh, I can't think of the term that I'm trying to come up with, but the, uh, you know, it, it sort of over helps, uh, helps overcome some of that muteness to um, you know what what the individual's needs are uh, so I'll, I'll speak to an example one of the things that we hear through the work we do are things like oh my doctor told me to stop eating rice or stop eating tortillas it's like that is that is a big part of someone's culture I myself am of South Asian descent rice and roti and um, those things are a big part of it, and I know that any anyone in my family, if they are ever told to stop eating rice, they will leave the doctor or the dietitian before they leave the rice. So, how do you deal with some of those challenges and really helping people uh, one overcome some of those um, recommendations we will call them that they receive in a way that is safe and inclusive for them? Yeah. Ah, that resonates so much because as the East Asian, rice is also big in our culture. So um, I would not advocate for my clients who are from those backgrounds to have to ditch the things that mean so much to them, that bring so much enjoyment to them. Um, so for me, I typically start with explaining the nutrition science concept. Like why, do, why did their doctor, for example, um, 
advise them to not eat certain things, uh, rice, roti, tortillas, for example, um, and start from there to give them the information of where that recommendation was coming from. And then from there, because they have the information, there's a, a gained understanding from where the rationale is, they can start to tell me like, okay, well, if it is really trying to get at reducing my carbohydrate intake, can we work on something else that will achieve something similar in reducing the carb intake without having to take away the things that I enjoy the most? So that oftentimes is my first place to start with my clients. And then, you know, we can identify the things together in a typical day or in their eating pattern that will fit um, that requirement. And so we can still achieve the same outcome. So for example, if, um, if they're eating a lot of fruits as well, instead of taking away the rice, which may mean a lot to them, um, it's a staple in their household, we can start with moderating the amount of fruit intake that they have to reduce the carbohydrate intake. Or if they're snacking on something that has a lot of added sugars, refined sugars, that would be another place that we can work on instead of taking away the tortilla that may mean so much to, to the client. I love that approach. Um, you know, looking at uh, some of the work that you're doing with communal uh, table wellness, uh, we can see that an aspect of this is really that non-judgment, right? Why is having this non-judgment environment really important when it comes to nutrition? And how do you see it benefiting individuals? Yeah, so it's really important for me. And um, also, I think it really empowers my clients. Um, or I try to empower my clients to create that non-judgmental environment or approach for themselves for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is because, again, going back to how food holds a lot of different meanings and significance for each one of us. Um, to put myself as an example, I grew up in Hong Kong and there are these delicious custardy egg tarts. That's one of my favorite, favorite foods. And so if somebody judges me for indulging in them because they're unhealthy, that wouldn't really make me feel good because I feel like my own history with that food, with the place and the memories that go along with them are being criticized. Um, and then another reason is that I think food is a big part of most people's identity and increasingly it has become people's social identity as well. And so social identity is more like a membership in a social group. And so traditional social identities revolve around class, race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, sports teams even. Um, and I think these identities provide a sense of belonging and also pride and self-esteem. But how nutrition is perceived now and talked about, I would make a case that social identity now really includes people's nutrition approach and dietary preferences. And so the way that we eat, the eating pattern that we follow, they aren't just mere habits and practices. Some people identify very strongly with those things and take them on as identities. And so related to that, how a person eats has really become a proxy of how they perceive themselves and how they want the world to see them potentially. So I think we've all witnessed people who follow certain diets <laughs> and they are very strong about that being a part of their identity and they will go back and forth with people who don't agree with their approach um, using articles and documentaries as their ammo. And so I think because social identities are so important for how we make sense of ourselves, our belonging, we, feel, we can feel like we're under attack when somebody disagrees with or judges our identity. And dialogue and progress are really hard to get to when we feel like we're being attacked. So all that to say, this is why I think a non-judgmental approach is really important to me and my clients and the work that we do. Can you speak to a, an example or certain successes or memorable uh, folks that you have worked with um, that have that you've seen the impact of some of this that you're referring to here uh, within their outcomes? Yeah. Um, so I think not quite successful or un unsuccessful, but definitely memorable cases. And these examples that I will share really 
hinge on why context matters. And I think in today's uh, age, like context is a little bit hard to come by. There's a lot of content everywhere, <laughs> um, but how to make sense of it all really um, is a key to what we do as dietitians. I think even just a key to being human beings. Um, so there was a memorable case where um, I was working with a patient who has been going through uh, bariatric surgery. Um, she had come to our clinic uh, for pre-surgery work just to get herself ready for the surgery, but also post-operatively working on monitoring her intake and making sure that she doesn't have any nutrient deficiencies. And I was very fortunate enough to work on a team where there was also a psychologist. And so we really work in tandem and collaboration. And so in a lot of the, the interactions that we have with the patients, things that are tangentially related to food uh, comes up and family dynamics often comes up. Um, and she was mentioning how she felt like her family and friends were sabotaging her. Um, because she's had the surgery, she cannot eat the same foods as before, but seemingly people are just presenting her with all these things that she can't eat in portions that were very inappropriate. And this was quite a few years back, so I was at a uh, less mature understanding of like, well, why would that be? Like, why would somebody who's you know considered a family member or a friend be actively sabotaging somebody's efforts to become healthier Mm -hmm. And so it came to light that my patient's body size kind of served as some kind of yardstick for the family and friends. And so when she was no longer at that size in that larger body, they felt dis just confused. Um, they didn't know what to do. And she, they, they just wanted to um, make sense of, well, she always served at that yard as that yardstick as that barometer for us like as long as we were not larger than her we were okay and that really kind of blew my mind in a sense that oh okay it's not just what my patient knows how to take care of herself and it's not even about helping her family and friends understand what is the dietary pattern that she needs to follow now but that social context, that familial context of family dynamics, of social dynamics really come into play. And so that was a really long conversation, but that was a very memorable case. Thank you so much for sharing that, Elizabeth. Um, unfortunately, we are toward the end of the time in this episode. At this point, I would love for our listeners to know how they can connect with you and learn more about your work. Yeah. Um, so folks can learn more about my work at communaltable.co um, and folks will find links to uh, how to book a coaching session, browse my selection of cookbook recommendations, um, and much more there. And I also write a monthly-ish newsletter called Hey Hey for anyone who's interested in curated lists of recipes, musings about food, culture, and general wellness. The link to sign up is at communaltable.co slash newsletter, but also you can find uh, the link uh, to the newsletter sign up on my website. Lovely. Okay, that is helpful. Thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. It's been such a pleasure talking to you here today. To our listeners, it is that time again. Head over to our social media and answer this quick question. What are some unique nutrition coaching that you've experienced? So what kind of nutrition coaching uh, have you experienced and what would you like to see more of? So we'll continue the conversation there. Again, find us on at Yumlish at both Facebook, on Instagram. Find this podcast post and comment below to tell us, again, what are some unique nutrition coaching that you have experienced and what you would like to see more of. We'll continue the conversation there after the episode. With that, Elizabeth, thank you so much again. Thank you for the conversation.